What I am going to show you this morning is setting up data classes, then setting up rules, classification of an Oracle database, and then masking. So I'm going to start with setting up data classes, which you will find in preferences. And the reason this is in preferences is because data classes represent typically business rules. They're more of a global definition. A credit card is always going to be a credit card, no matter whatever, what type of project you're working on. Workbench does pre-ship with some data classes already loaded. You can, of course, edit, remove, add as needed. To give you an example, here I am going to show you credit card. You can see down below that there is a regular expression pattern matcher. So this is going to match the data that is contained in your data set. Additionally, down below is what we call a validator script. Some patterns need additional checks as far as like computation, like checksums in a national ID. So we provide, and you can add also a JavaScript file, which will allow you to check computation. Obviously a regular expression can't do arithmetic. So that is an additional uh, validation item here that is available. An additional item that you can add as far as matchers, data matchers, are what we call set files. They're basically a single column list of data. And what that does is checks for the content. So if your data contains any first name, space, last name, and another file has last, comma, space, first name. So you can mix and match as needed. So if it's going to find a positive match to either one of these files, it is going to consider, or an item in that file is going to consider it a match to full name. Now, a third way to match is you can see highlighted on the screen that I have last name, but it kind of looks like a regular expression. So you can actually match on the column name to the data class. So for instance, if this matcher find or if this particular data class will match to anything that is similar to l space name or l dash name or last dash name it'll consider it a match and again this matches on the name so it bypasses actually matching in the data so it's a way to kind of speed up your classification process if you don't have if you know where your sensitive data is and you can kind of create your data classes to match on column name. It'll speed up the classification process. The last item on the screen is this matching threshold up the top. And what that's going to do is allow you to speed up the scan even more. The way classification works is it the original block of data it grabs is 12k rows and it's going to run through all the data and all the matchers and compare them. And then when it finds a match that exceeds this threshold, it is going to stop and move on to the next column. If it does not exceed that threshold, it is going to continue and grab another 4K block of data and compare it. And it will continue grabbing 4K blocks until it reaches the end of the file or it reaches this matching threshold. So again, it's another way to kind of speed up the classification process. Setting up rules here, I have a list of types. We are going to be dealing with field rules today. Now what rules do is go into a library. So this is per project base. So this library is going to be stored in, in my project on the left in the project Explorer. Now we kind of do this because let's say you have a test data generation project, you might have a masking project, you can make different libraries based on your project. However, it's completely not necessary. You can see I have a whole list of rules here defined by uh, categories. However, you can have as many rules and different types of rules in one library as needed if you were to do just a single library. I'm going to start with our redaction function, which is our most, the easiest one to use. And the default here is to replace all of the characters with an asterisk. Obviously super easy and just like a single click item. But we do have other, what we call predefined mask. For instance, this one that's a credit card is going to mask everything but the last four digits. 
can see here we have a bunch of different ones for various different types of IDs. So our social security number will mask the first five digits, leave the dashes exposed and the last four digits. Now I can certainly add my own, which I'm going to do because I happen to know that my social security numbers in my data set do not have dashes. So I just want to design my own mask, which is starting at position one for a length of five and replace those with asterisks as well. And then I'll click add, add it two of them. Add to table. Now, as you can see, I can add as many different type of, or sections of masks as I need to create the result I'm looking for. So I'll just click finish there. And the uh, rule was here added to this library. If I click on them down below, I can actually see the details. For instance, this particular one, I can actually see the algorithm that is actually going to be applied once I applied this rule. I can edit here if I need to, or just use it as confirmation of my rules. Now, the next rule I am going to use is going to be our most popular rule, which is one of our encryption functions. You can see here on the list, I have a bunch of algorithms that start with either DEC or ENC. So those represent decryption and encryption. If I select an encryption algorithm and it has a matching DEC, decryption algorithm, then it can be reversed. However, you have to retain the passphrase. So the one I'm going to choose here is our alphanum format preserving encryption. What this does is replace uppercase characters with uppercase, lowercase with lowercase, digits with digits. It also preserves the length of the original data. So that's particularly helpful when you're loading into a database that has column size constraints. And I am just going to type in a passphrase here. We do have other ways to do passphrases, passphrase files, key vault managers, etc. This is just the easiest to demonstrate. And I'll click finish here. And the last rule I am going to show you is our pseudonymization. I will open up the set file here. This is a two column set file. The first column is last names in alphabetical order and deduped. The second column is the same names, just scrambled and then added to the file. So anytime I see Abram, for instance, I am going to replace it with Mead in any data set that I use this rule on. So it allows me to do consistent replacement across whatever data set I need. So in order to use it, I just need to sign a pseudonymized rule that selects that file. We do have other options for pseudonymization in the upper section. We have, we ship with a few set files standard set files that will allow you to randomly draw from a single column set file and do a random replacement. Obviously, this is not consistent across different data sets because it is random. So I'm going to use the lower section and assign my two column set file. And I'm going to use the original file as a lookup. And the last item here is this default value. So if it does not find a uh, value that matches in my data set into the set file, it is going to replace the value with missing. So you can see my three different rules here that I will be using in the next step. The next step is classification. And you can see in the lower left in my data source explorer this morning, I'm going to be using an Oracle database. It has about 50 tables of varying sizes in it. In order to classify, I am going to select my schema and select schema data class search. Now here is some details that I can choose to design my job. The first item is this include matching on column names, which as I explained earlier, you can use that to kind of speed up the process. It is optional. The second item is to skip sources already in previous scans. So this is particularly helpful if say I have a schema 
that I've already scanned, but then I have added tables to that schema, but I don't really need to classify what I have already scanned. So if I select that and tell it attach a previous scan to it, then it will bypass anything it's previously scanned and only scan the new tables. This override option, one of the, the main output that this scan will make is what we call a data class library. And you can run this scan multiple times and it will add to that library. So this will just allow you to override existing mappings if you need to. The important part is this section at the bottom, which is how to match. The first one is what I discussed and it will grab 4K blocks and try to match to this matching threshold. Another option is to scan 100% of the data. And the last option is to not scan any of the data and just use your column matching names. Particularly helpful if you already know your column names and you've set up your data matchers or your data classes to match on name. It will speed up the process significantly because it doesn't have to scan the data. I'm gonna leave the default here. So the next one is my schema selection. I happen to only have one schema in my Oracle database, which is why only one is showing up. You can add multiple schemas per database, uh, per scan. However, you just be, need to be conscious of how big those schemas are and how long the process might take. This next option allows me to select the data type of the columns I wanna scan. The default is to select all the text type files. So for instance, if I have columns in my database that are dates or timestamps and I don't consider those sensitive data, then I can just choose to not include them during the scan so it'll speed everything up. I know I have some numeric columns, so I'll go ahead and select that here. This Page to exclude item is an additional way to speed up scans. Um, some databases have tables that include metadata, not actual data. So I can choose to exclude a specific table and or column on this page. I don't have any, so I'm going to click next. Here is where I select the data class types that I wanna use during this scan. So I am just gonna select a few here. Oops, last name bow and pin and click finish. Now, if you look at the bottom of my screen here, my progress bar, you can see that it is going through every single table and every single column in my Scott schema and comparing it to those data classes that I selected. While that's running, I'm gonna show you some of the outputs it's already started making. This particular item is my table search results log, and you can see it's appending to it as I'm talking to you. What this does is records every single table it has successfully scanned. So this is helpful auditing thing. For instance, this is the list that will be used if you select do not include these in previous scans. The other thing is to check it for completion. So if I run this overnight and I can come back in the morning and confirm that the scan completed, I can just go to the last. You can see that my last table in the schema is year department amount, and I can confirm that my last table in my schema is year department amount so that I know that that scan completed 100% successfully. The other item that it makes is this column search results. And this is a kind of really quick glance at the positive columns that it found positive matches to during this scan. However, the important item was the one that had blinked up when I was talking, which is our data class library. And you can see at the top of the screen, I have my five data classes that I selected. In the middle, I have my Oracle tables that it found a positive match to. And down below is the actual mapping, which I'll show you later, that shows the actual result set. However, the easiest way to see the results is to actually click on one of these tables and I can see the results in the right hand. Now, give it a second to populate. The upper section is the results and the bottom section is a preview of the data in case you need to have a reminder of what's actually in that data source so that you can double check the results. So you can see here 
that I had a positive result for my employee SID and it assigned PIN US 100%. So what this means is 100% of the data matched my matcher in PIN US. You can see last name and email were actually matched on the column name instead of actually in the data. And down below, my manager SID also matched on PIN US. Now you can see here what I've highlighted is phone number. And if you recall, I did include phone US as a data class in my scan, but it didn't have a match here listed. If I need to review my result set, I can do that here and I can also classify again. So if I click this button, auto classify, and I want to run just on one column to give a better indication on why it didn't match, I can go ahead and select that. Now, by doing this auto classification, it does scan 100% of the results. And you can see here, it came back with 23% matching. And if you recall, my option that I selected was to match 90% of the data or greater. So that's why it didn't match during the schema scan is that I had that option selected. Now I happen to know that it only matches 23% because I do have invalid US phone numbers in my data set. Now I still want them masked, so I'm gonna go ahead and leave that selected. Now I do have the option by clicking in the data class to edit anything that I need, different data class, result set, I can change the data class that was applied to per column here. I can of course also remove any mappings I need to as well. Now you can see I have a field rule column here at the end and it is empty. Now I can go ahead and add a rule right here by clicking in that field and I have my three rules that I set up ahead of time already populated. However, that would take a long time to go through every single column in all of these data sets if I have a really big result set. So the faster way to do this is to actually assign the rule to the data class itself. So you can see here, I have my same three rules and I'm just going to go ahead and apply them to the rules. So anytime it sees email, for instance, it is going to automatically apply this encryption rule that I have assigned here to it. So let me just assign all these, my pseudonymization rule for last name, the other ones get encryption, and then my pin US gets the redaction rule. So now if I go back to my table and give it a second to populate, it is going to assign all my rules for me. So this allows it, me to do a quicker rule assignment as well as assign rules consistently no matter what data set I have. No matter what table, I can include multiple types of sources in the same data class library. In this particular case, I only have Oracle, but I can of course include a MySQL table or a MongoDB table all in the same data set and I can include files as well and mix and match as needed. So anytime I see anything assigned pin US, no matter what the data source is, it's always going to assign the same field redaction rule. So this allows me to retain referential integrity. Now I can go ahead and edit this as needed as well by adding data sources and removing them. You can see this table ends in the word encrypted, so obviously I do not need to use that during this process. I can go ahead and remove that table here. Yes, you can mix and match as needed. If I click on my data source explorer, these are the databases that we currently support in natively. Um, you can see there is a generic JDBC here. So as long as you have a JDBC and an, an ODBC connection, you can add them to this to Workbench and manipulate them. Next step is actually the masking process to set up the masking job. So what I'm going to do is I am going to right click on the library and select database masking job. Now, as I explained earlier, I can mix and match different databases and files in the same data class library. However, when I run the masking job, I do have to do files and databases separately because of the target is obviously format is different.
here my important item is this output down below so different means a different target and that could be a different vendor as far as your database it could be a different schema within the same database it really doesn't matter there will be a page that will allow you to map from source to target the other option here is same so what this is going to do is replace the data in your current source with your new data from running this job masking what is going to do is use an update statement and your primary key or if you don't have a primary key in the table it will use the the first column in the data set so this allows me to speed up the masking process because it's only reading and changing the data that is actually being changed by rules. The last item is flat file. So it is going to create a flat file instead of loading into a table for every single source table. Particularly helpful when you run this scan for the first time so that you can verify that your output is as expected before you load it into your target database. I'm gonna leave it here for this demo because it's the easiest to show you as well. This screen allows me to select the data classes that I wanna include in this scan. I'm gonna leave all five of those selected. This screen allows me to further select the sources. So these are all the sources from that data class library. Now I can, of course, exclude anything I need to. For instance, I happen to know that these two tables are empty, so I don't really need to include them in the process. And I'll click Finish. And you can see down in my progress bar down below that it is creating all of the job scripts for the masking job. Now, at this point, it has not masked anything. All it is doing is creating the job scripts to do the next step, which is the actual masking process. So if I show you the outputs it's creating, they're showing up in the left-hand side in my project explorer here. And you can see it's populating what we call scripts, these SCL files. And then the option or the item that is in the process of opening now is going to be our flow diagram. And this is a visual representation of the job. Now I happen to be on a Windows machine. So this particular flow diagram represents a batch file. If I was on a Linux machine, it would create a shell script. You can see here, it has my eight tables that I had masking rules applied to in a visual representation. So if I show you this employees, double click the transform mapping log and show you the actual visual representation of what it is doing to my employees table that I showed you earlier. You can see here, I have an input section, which is my original Oracle table. I have an action section, in this case, report, as opposed to join or a sort, and then my output flat file here. The most important thing and most noticeable thing is the difference between the color of the lines, blue and orange, in my outputs. The blue lines represent data that is purely being passed from output or input to output without being changed. The orange ones represent data that is being derived from the input data. So if I click that, you can see at the bottom of the screen, this particular one has the algorithm replace cars applied to it. So it's a quick way to glance and see exactly which fields are being changed during the masking process or will be changed during the masking process. Now, as I stated, this represents a job script. So if I show you, open up this SCL file, I can show you what the actual script looks like. This is what will be read by COSORT, or the backend engine, and actually do the manipulation. Set up the same way, I have an input section, an action section, and an output section. And you can see my actual algorithms here that will be applied to specific fields. Now, if I show you, again, nothing has been scanned or masked yet. So let me show you what this employee table looks like as is right now. Uh, various different items as far as names and ID numbers and phone numbers, etc., to represent an employee. Now, as I stated that this flow diagram actually represents a batch file, so I can show you that batch file here. In this particular case, it's because I'm going to flat files, it's kind of a simplistic 
batch file. So this is just calling the sort CL and executing all of those scripts in a particular order. Now, if I was loading into a database, I might also have additional blocks in here, which would be things like if the table doesn't exist, it'll create, it, it'll execute a DDL for me to create those tables to the, in the target. I can add blocks to do other SQL items like enabling and disabling foreign keys, etc. This one just is simplistic because I'm only doing targeting flat files. Now, one of the things I didn't mention, if you can see where my cursor is in the project explorer on the left, you can see that I have tags at the end of my project names, and these are my Git repository tags. So we do support Git and SVN, et cetera, other whatever version control system that you might use. So you, these files can be passed around and shared and, and put into version control systems so that you can keep track of different versions. Because our backend engine is a command line process, you can actually send these to a different server to be run. You can use a scheduling system to run these files as well. You can see all of my projects or uh, all of my job files are contained within this single folder. So you execute them as needed elsewhere. I'm going to go ahead and show you how it's executed here in Workbench by just clicking that batch file and doing run as batch program. And my console opens up. You can see here down below that it's just showing you the status. So it's running through all of those SCL scripts and executing them while I'm talking to you. And I can go ahead and see that I do have some results already available to me. All of these out files are created during this process as my target. So my job has terminated here, so I can go ahead and open one of these and show you the comparison. You can see I did not change my ID number, but the employee SID has been redacted except for the last four digits. My first name I did not apply a rule to, so it exists. My last name is a different last name compared to the source because I use pseudonymization and email was encrypted. So it still kind of looks like an email because it retained all of the special characters like at signs and periods, but the actual data is changed. Same with phone number. It looks like a phone number, but it is a different phone number than the original data set. This shows you how we can mass data and you can add different rules in the same data set and all be run at the same time. That's a good question. The answer is probably either one of them because we have both kinds of users operating the tool. If we look at the many customers we have around the world and their job titles, you see DBA, senior DBA, data architect, solutions architect, data governance architect, these kinds of, of job titles are very common. So either one or some combination of those skills are really the best, actually. It helps, of course, if you know Eclipse 2 as a developer, but it's not critical. I mean, you don't have to have senior DBA skills either, but it helps to have experience with connecting to your database. Sometimes a lot of time in the beginning is taken just reaching the sources and targets with the drivers because they're in the cloud, where they involve different layers of authentication that have to be set up. But as long as you guys already have experience with that in your own environment and applications, this is not much different, really. It's, it's the same kinds of drivers that other software use to reach the data in your database according to your own security and authorization policies. Claudia only demonstrated data classification search and masking for relational databases, but the IRI software environment that you see here is capable of much more, including operations that can run simultaneously with these data masking jobs. For example, you can do data integration, ETL, with masking. You can do database subsetting with masking. You can do test data synthesis by creating or generating test data for a relational database, just like this with constraints that respect the structural and 
referential integrity of the production schema, but do not require you to mask the actual data since you are using the metadata to create it from scratch. There's other capabilities in here around data validation and cleansing and report generation and migration. There's a whole infrastructure built around this structured data definition and processing through those scripts that Claudia showed you. The same scripts that do the masking do all that other kind of work as well. You would be getting a much more powerful environment with this tool because there is much more than masking which is possible while you read the data. Yes, you're right. For example, we have done a large Oracle masking project in a PeopleSoft environment with multiple schemas and many, many tables. One of the large tables had like 20, 21 million rows or something, and we were able to encrypt it in 11 minutes, I think, using a PC on a different computer from the actual data source. So it's really the speed of your network connection that matters the most because the actual masking operation is bound by the IO and travel constraints of the data. Not so much the computational overhead of something like encryption, which is pretty nominal. So however quickly you can read and write this data based on your gigabit ethernet switch or a fast IO channel with SSD disk drives where the database is, for example, can really speed up the jobs even more. But it's all about how quickly you can read and write, update an entire table. And there are things you can do to make jobs smaller and faster as well like incremental data masking, which is where you just work on new rows based on an analysis like a timestamp column. So anything that is later than a certain date or the last date that you did the job, that can be part of the program. 